Hey everybody, Jim Ingersoll here. Welcome back to the Real Estate Success Podcast. I'm your host today. I've got a very good friend of mine who's been a mentor and a friend of uh, our families for many, many years now, which is Walter Wolford. He's on with me as well. And um, thinking back to how I got started in real estate, the second time I restarted uh, was people like Walter that really reached out and helped us get going and, and keep things going the right way. And we're gonna talk uh, in depth today about asset protection and privacy. It's a topic both Walter and I love and are very passionate about. And it's one you're gonna to wanna to learn about because there's some very simple things you can do differently to protect your family's legacy and preserve um, all your hard work for the future. So Walter, welcome to Real Estate Success. Thank you, Jim, glad to be here. So everybody knows you. I mean, you're like real estate famous and you- That's because I'm old, I'm old. <laughs> I'm in that category now too, it's on Hey, Med Medicare next month, baby, I'm very Ooh, excited about that. Not even imagine, all right. It'll come quicker than I know, I know that. But let's go back to like before everybody knew you in real estate, you were real estate famous and all of that. I mean, you're always been sort of a serial entrepreneur. I know you did some oil and gas stuff. You've owned different businesses along the way before you locked into real estate. So let's go back to there a little bit and tell people what you used to do. Oh, well, let's see how far back you want to go, Jim. Uh, I remember as a sophomore in college, knocking on doors to buy houses without any training whatsoever. Wow. And uh, I saw how important it was. Uh, I, I managed to get a house under contract. It, it was a, in a neighborhood right by the college and it had five apartments. They, it was a big house. They'd, so people were renting them out to students. I said, you know, I need to get that. I can, <laughs> I can see how I can move into one of those and have a, a free house, a free, you know, yeah. Somebody else paying for it, and I got it. It was a thirty-two five was the price, huh. and this was back. Well, this would have been about seventy-eight or so, huh. and uh, it. I didn't have the skill to complete the contract. It fell out over a three hundred dollar item. Uh -huh. Fast forward a few years, oh maybe seven or eight years, I bought a house three doors down, and I paid one hundred and twenty-five thousand for it. <laughs> And the house that I did not get under contract sold just as it was for 159. Wow! So it was just before the ride up in that yeah. time period, and so I saw that what real estate, you know, could do. I mean, that that would have, at that age, that would have been a life changing event to have your house paid for the for the rest of your life or, or move out. It really doesn't take a lot of assets to really. Um, create change in your life. I mean, looking back, it's it's not as many as people think. I mean, I used to think when I got started and I was going to see Jack Miller and people, I was thinking, I think I need like a hundred doors or something. Well, first of, all, first of all, we're talking about ownerships overrated today, but it doesn't really take that many deals to really uh, make an impact on your life. So that was in college. What did you take in college? It's a business court, business administration. And I, I, I tell you what, I have never given anybody my resume or my transcript. That's awesome. I, and and if, if I had had a mentor, somebody like Jack Miller in my life at that time, yeah. I personally, I'm one of those guys who think I'd be way better off had not gone to college. Mm -hmm. Way better off. But, you know, because if I was out there buying real estate by my own initiative, imagine if I had some training. <laughs> Amazing. Uh, but, but what I, what I started to do was uh, the only way I knew how to buy houses was to get the owner to finance it. And so I bought the first house. I moved into it, seller financing. Next house, the first 17 houses in a row, I put $2,000 down. And wow. that's how I'm, and they were all, you know, they were all payments that the tenant and the house could afford. So that was number one important thing. And so, after I did that, I started acquiring a bunch more rentals and uh, realized, and I, I had went to the bank, stupid bank loans, had over a hundred bank loans, idiotic, all in my personal name, stupid, idiotic, right? Oh, yeah. and, and I had a dog bite case Ooh. and I got served, I got served uh, for a house that I didn't own at the time that I'd owned it a year before when this uh, meter reader was coming to cut the power off and the tenant sick their big dog on them. Okay. And uh, it gnawed on him a little bit. And then, so he sued for $50,000, the owner of the property. All right. So I didn't know about the dog. 
I didn't own it. I didn't give the, the tenant permission to have the dog. And guess what? I got, I got a little, uh, a taste of what it's like to have all your assets at jeopardy at one time. Mm -hmm. Cause if that, if they, they, by the way, they did win settled out of court, but, uh, had they put the judgment against that house, it would have attached to other house that I had at the time in that same True. entity. So the, so the topic about trust is they separate your entities. Very important piece. We'll start. Yes, they do. Yes, they do. So I, I mean, you think once you sell a house, liability ends, but in that case, it didn't for you. Yeah, that's exactly right. Cause it happened. Well, it happened during the time of my ownership. Right. So, yeah, well, uh, you know, the question I'd like, uh, let's just go back and forth because this is on my mind right now, but under what circumstances would you like the public not to know that you own that property? Can you think of any? All of them. <laughs> <laughs> Can I give you one that just happened a couple months ago? Sure. Um, we were working on some apartments and you ever heard of Rentley? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so Rentley is a Bluetooth lockbox that allows tenants to show the property themselves, okay? I loved it for a couple of years until this happened. Somebody targeted my Rentley box from another country, and they rented my apartment to somebody I didn't know. <laughs> Can you imagine the surprise? I mean, we've all heard landlording stories, but I send my contractor in for something, and he's like, Jim, there's somebody living in your apartment. And I'm like, there's no possible way somebody's living in my apartment. He's like, yeah, and there's a plastic pool in the bathroom and there are live ducks in the pool. I'm like, OMG. So I start, I call, call Rentley. They keep track of everybody who comes in and out, fortunately. And I just started calling every person that was in and out until I got one girl and she's like, yeah, I moved in uh, two days ago. Thanks for renting me the place. And I'm like, mm, this isn't happening, right? So anyways, long story short, I had to get all her stuff out. We called the police. All that's fine until her, somebody in her family contacted me. And they wanted me to pay her back for the money that she shipped off to this guy overseas. By the way, she shipped it by getting gift cards, taking pictures of them, and texting them to the guy, which was, I think, $1,300. And, and the, the family member's like, you know, you're obviously doing well. I see you. And they knew my name, Walter. This is scary. But they're like, we Googled you. We know, you know, that you teach people. You do different things. And, uh, and I told him, I said, well, I can't help you because I don't own the property. And he's like, what do you mean you don't own the property? I said, I'm just working with a property manager here. And the truth is, I didn't own it. And uh, he said, here's exactly what he said. He said, Jim, if you don't own the property, our discussion is over right now. That was the last time I ever heard from him. So you don't want to own. Well, the, the fraudsters are alive and well out there. And particularly in the short-term rental business recently, maybe we can talk about that another time, but <laughs> yeah, they, they're, uh, they're fraud attempts. And let me, let me just tell you how one way that they do yeah, it. I'd love to hear it. All right, so I, I want to book your place through Airbnb. And then you get to talking and say, no, my company is going to send a check to you because I'm on business. Right. Mm. And so that's all well and good. But you get the check and it's for more than the amount. Yeah. Then in this case, it was, that I was going to collect $850, but it was something like $2,850. Wow. And so the next day he starts pressuring my guest relation person to, to refund the money ex over it. And I wasn't paying enough attention because I have seen this before, but I PayPal $1,950 to this guy. Oh, wow. The next day the check bounces. Of course. And so, you know, anytime you get off the system, things like that can happen. That's not what we're here to talk about today, but let me give you one, a reason why. Well, you don't want your Airbnb guests to know that you own the house either. That's right. That's but go exactly. ahead. I want to hear your example. Well, I had a, I, I filed an incident report yesterday with the police 
uh, I've got a vandalism claim. And the policeman said, yeah, we caught the guys who did this. It happened a couple of weeks ago. And they're in jail right now, but we couldn't find you. <laughs> we didn't know how, you know, so it's, it's, it's good and bad. Do you, sometimes you want people to find you, but he, yep. he didn't. So the police couldn't find me. Now, maybe they don't know how to search records. Even if they did, my name wouldn't have popped up. So when you got another one where you might not want to let the public know you got. How I mean, I, just, there, I don't think, I cannot think of a scenario where I want people to know what I own. Yeah. Like, well, what about if you, if you had, um, if you had mold in your house, we got a lot of rain down here. Yeah. Do you, would you think the tenant would? I, yeah. Mold, dogs, fire. pit bulls. Yeah. Any of that stuff. So there's a reason why you should set, set your business up to protect you from the predators out there. And they are, they're really out there. You know, it can be as simple as somebody's cutting the grass of your property and they cut their toe off on the lawnmower. I know somebody recently who had an apartment uh, building in Pennsylvania that had like a, had a concrete sidewalk, but it had a little bit of a lift in one of the things the tenant fell and, and got hurt, sued for the damages. I mean, we could probably just go on and on and probably scare all of ourselves out of ever investing. How about one more for you? All right. My son, Walt, who, who renovates houses, had a contract worker, been a painter with him for many years, and he carried workman's comp on his, uh, the painter was up there painting and a wasp stung him and he died 10 minutes later. Oh my gosh. Now, can you see a scenario that the owner could be sued or whoever hired him to be on there? Wow. And, and it, the workman's comp claim, I think, is going to work out to pay the family a half million dollars. Wow. So that's, that's big thing. So the ownership, if you have the property in a trust, it just stops there. Yep. That's the point. <laughs> so trusts scare people. They don't understand them. You know, they're used to buying houses, first of all, in their personal name, or, or if you're a little more sophisticated, maybe in an LLC. But the way you, you convey the deed and the name on the deed is, is really important, and the trust is really the best way to do it. I convey in a land trust. Well, th uh, so let's make a comparison. So you, most real estate investors go form an LLC. And by the way, most real estate investors have not had any training on how to properly hold title. It just doesn't, doesn't exist. Well, I brought it up. I agree. Uh, so if you go look on the secretary of state's website, you can see who is a member of that LLC. Now the LLCs protect the members, but it doesn't mean that the assets can't be taken away that the LLC owns. Right? Right. Now let's compare that. You had to go to the state to get permission to have an LLC and it's full disclosure who's involved. All right. So now let's compare it to trust and a trust is a contractual agreement between the creator, the person or persons who started, created, and then most often they're the beneficiaries. So that's a, that's a grantor trust where you got the grantor and the beneficiaries typically are the same. Okay. You got a third party that's a trustee. Well, it, it's really a second party, isn't it? Because these two have the same role, same right. role. That's true. So, so the trustee is the legal and equitable owner of the property for the benefit of the beneficiaries. So when you made the statement, I don't own the property, that's right. The trustee is the proper owner of that. Okay? Yep. Uh, and so the, the benefits, the avails, the profits, the cash, all that flows down to the beneficiary, but the beneficiary directs the trustee. The trustee can't do anything without written direction from the beneficiaries in these type trust. Now you can, you can move the power of direction that the beneficiary has. You can move that actually. It can be moved to the grantor from and it could be moved to the trustee. And that's a, a lot of different trusts operate different ways. This is a land trust we're talking about. Right. Been around a long, long time, way, way back Roman days. They've been using these things way longer than corporations, way longer than the LLCs. And so it's, it's a contract between these parties that acts like an entity. But in fact, it's not an entity. It's a contract. 
Yep, and, and it's it's great because it's sort of like a promissory note in, in the regard that it doesn't get filed at the courthouse either. Well, here, here each state has their own laws. Uh, there's uniform trust code is shared by about 30, 35 states, and they're very similar in how they operate. Texas is not part of that group. Huh. They have their own uh, trust code. So you need to go, and it doesn't take long to read that stuff. Just go read it. It's, it's understandable. It tells you how to trust creation, what's involved in that. Uh, so, you know, the, the point that you wanted to have all the moving parts off record, out of public view, you asked the question is, do you have to show evidence of it? Well, the Uniform Trust Code says that you got to file a certificate or a memorandum of trust right. sometime during your ownership. Right. It doesn't have to be at the front end. You usually file those things on the way out when you're selling them. But, it, but in any case, it doesn't disclose who the beneficiary is. Yep, so that's, that's good. Um, so when you go to the tax records and you look, then every property that you happen to own will, will have a different name. I like to use a different name on every one. And, and sometimes the trustee name will show up, but your name as the beneficiary will never show up. And you can't go to the courthouse and do a title search and figure out who the beneficiary is. You can make some assumptions. Sometimes, yes. All right, so here's something that has been great. So I, I form a land trust. I go to negotiate with the seller for seller financing. Okay, no problem with that. And then, uh, and let's just say I created a $1,000 down and a $25,000 mortgage, 100 payments at 3% interest. I'm picking numbers. All right. And, and so you could use the same thing with the numbers in your market. So 25,000 purchase, 1,000 down, title in a trust. Now, I, I sold that property. Now, because I negotiated financing and because it was in a trust, it's more valuable than $25,000, right? Of course. So I sold my share of the trust for $7,500. No, nothing changed on the title. Right. You basically wholesaled it. With financing, using the entity, the trust right. entity to do that. That's now, that beneficial to do that? So the person that bought it's never, he's not on title. Right. And because it's in a trust, that is a non-recourse loan to him. Now, of course, I did that. I created non-recourse when I bought it which means that the owner doesn't have any personal liability. Mm -hmm. That means that, the, that the, uh, the, note holder, the note holder can foreclose for non-payment, but there's no personal liability. Only one property. Yeah, that's right. They can't go against like an entire rental portfolio or whatever else you own. Well, that's right. So anything that I sign in terms of a note is going to be non-recourse. And the reason is in the IRA world, you've got to do that. Right. If your IRA is borrowing money, it's got to be non-recourse. The IRA owner can't guarantee it. You know, so anyway, so that, that you say how valuable that little, that little model right there is go negotiate to buy something with good financing and a trust and then just go sell the entity. Right. I, cool is that? I like it. It's simple and it's easy. So you've got a lot more content and information and teaching and things at uh, WalterWelford.com, right? Well, uh, not so much. That site is one that I just got back up since it's been hacked. <laughs> <laughs> That's the reason I'm not using WordPress sites. They got, they got hacked too easily. And as a matter of fact, every one of my sites got hacked. Really? I haven't had any get hacked yet. Not in a long time, a couple of years. Well, anyway, so this is, I'm using lead pages, which is a platform that yeah. is pretty easy to use. Uh, anyway, so at the site, you can go to the site and WalterWofford.com, W-O-F-F-O-R-D. And a couple of things are on that site you'll be interested in. One is it's got an uh, invitation to join the Financial Friends Network right there on the top. That's kind of important, isn't it? 
I think so. Yes, absolutely. There it is. I just took a look. Yes, you and Super Q. Yep. And then, so uh, you can just sign up there and scroll on down to the bottom and you'll see some upcoming events. And so just click on the Trust Firewalls and you, you can see what that is all about. Mm -hmm. So Trust Firewalls is coming up um, in, December. in December, right? Yeah. And so what, how we do this, Jim, you've been to them and uh -huh. we, we make sure they're a lot of fun. They are. But I've got six calls for putting on an event I haven't done many, many, many of them, is you limit it to 40 people. And so right now there are 30 people have signed up for it. Wow. And uh, what we do is it's two and a half day in Jackson, Mississippi. We, if people want to stay in one of our Airbnbs, we charge $150 for a bed for the four days, four or five days. Wow. Mm -hmm. stay. And uh, then the other thing is we feed you for lunch and every night, uh, folks are invited to come over to my house to have dinner and nice. cook, cook dinner for 40 people. And it works out just fine. Works out great. Well, you, I've been to that, but it was a long time ago, back when we used to just go to the Love Shack and have a great time. I know that one summer I came multiple times and, you know, it's just like you're doing the small dollar IRA thing. Every time you get a group together like that, you sort of expand the overall group of knowledge. And uh, so you've, I've learned a lot about trust by going to that and I highly recommend it. Well, I think, um, you know, if you had to pick the one thing that's the most important thing to master about the real estate business, you know, some might say financing, some might say wholesale, some might say management and landlord. I would say number one for me is trust because it's the foundation that allows you to keep what you've, what you've built. It doesn't allow you a predator to take it away from you very easily. Well, it's like putting a, um, a giant fence around what you have and making it invisible at the same time. <laughs> so well, and so we'll, we'll talk about all the, the documents that are involved in it and the various ways that you use trust. It's really not difficult. It's just those that are listening to this, you, you might be a little confused about it. But it just takes sitting down, reading the documents, and you realize this is a far superior way to operate. If you like the protection of your LLC, just have the LLC be the beneficiary. But it'll have to be a separate trust. Mm -hmm. but you, you need to find that dollar, don't you? Hey, uh, but you're absolutely right. And, and it's not difficult. Hang on just a second. Let me see if I can get her to stop. You got, you got a sacred signal. Oh, there we go. All right. So I don't know what she's barking at and I apologize for it. But no, it is really important and it's not complicated. And after I went to Jackson and I learned about this stuff, I was able to implement it pretty easily and I implemented it very quickly. And um, everything I buy now is in, in a land trust. It allows you to separate all of your properties and indeed them all with different names. So they're like if a fee attorney goes and they want to see everything that you own, so they know how much you've got in assets, they're gonna start with like your name and then they'll start with whatever the name the property is deeded with. And they're gonna see that, that name, that land trust name, there's nothing else tied to it. So they can't, they can't see who owns it and they don't know what other properties are owned, period. Well, I, years ago, I had a, a local landlord tell me this story, and it, it is true. Uh, tenant had some kind of uh, injury on, and hired an attorney. The attorney called the landlord, and the attorney said, you're going to pay me $2,500. I said, why do you think I'm going to pay that? He says, because I know what everything that you own yep. in that entity. I mean, that's the first stop is to go look and see what you got. Well, it's very difficult to figure out what you got. It is. And, you know, I like, you know, from the, from the marketing side, I love buying houses from landlords, but I can easily go to the tax records and, um, and I can market to landlords that own a lot of properties because I can just sort of guess at the names, either in an LLC or their personal name. And when I do that, I can see all the properties that they own, which is a great marketing opportunity for me also. But from an asset protection standpoint, they're screwed if anything ever goes wrong. 
Well, let's talk about some other benefits. All right, so when, when I, my impact investing is helping tenants become homeowners, right? Mm -hmm. And so when we acquire a property, usually it's a joint venture with a small dollar IRA and a large dollar IRA going in to own the entity, the trust, okay? The trust buys a property. Title comes into the, into the trust, just like any other transaction. You got an entity that's formed and title comes into the entity. So we'll do the rehab and then go find who qualifies. And so we convey from the trust to the homeowner. The homeowner signs a note and deed of trust back to the trust. So we actually converted the asset of the trust, which was real estate, we converted it into a note. Very easily done. So the trust can own personal property, which a note is, and real property. And you just you change the trust up to allow it to do that. So it's no, no big deal to do that. But it works very, very well. It's so well that if, if I have a personal judgment against me, it does not attach to the trust. Say that again, because people don't understand that. And that's powerful. All right, so the trust is a newly created entity. It's never been in existence before, okay? So the trust, the trust cannot have any judgments on a newly created entity. Hadn't been around long enough to get any. But even though I own it as a beneficiary, or even as a trustee, if I'm the trustee and somebody else is a beneficiary, if I had judgments against me personally, my role as a trustee, they cannot attach. So good stuff. So I, I encourage the tenants to become who become homeowners to take title in a trust. And uh, and there's a lot of re if it's good enough for me, and I usually pull up my hair and say, see this old gray stuff here? <laughs> some things I've learned along the way. And this is one of them. Is it, there's nothing bad that will happen if you take title in a trust that I know of. You can, I mean, if, if you got to go deed it out for some reason, deed it out. Not a big deal. So it's a great way to protect your family assets, really preserve your legacy. Also, um, protects you from the IRS as well, correct? Well, the, if the IRS can find whatever they want to find out, but it certainly pr protects you from probate, the expense of probate. That's a big one. Because when a beneficiary dies, the trust doesn't die. Right. And, and we I'll, have that. I, I can try to think, take three seconds and think about that. But yeah, I mean, that's a huge benefit. Here's another benefit that we here, here in Mississippi, we have this often. We have uh, two people, two unmarried people raising a blended family. And the reason they don't get married is because of the aid to dependent children. They get government checks not to be married, which is stupid, right? Right. But that's that's the reality we live in. So I get I get to put on my uh, marriage counselor hat, <laughs> and I, I so it's a guy and a gal. I ask the guy, all right. So they got each of them have their own kids, all right. So guy, and they're not going to get married. When if you die, who do you want your interest to go to? And they, they, then they look at each other, and that's that's a real test, isn't it? Yeah. Then I ask, well, and they got different answers, but the trust can allow that. It can say who the successors are, or it could be a joint tenancy arrangement where they, the surviving person gets it all, or they can say, no, my kids get, I want my kids to have it, my in the bloodline, and so they get to discuss all that. That they have never had that thought before in their life. <laughs> but, but this trust agreement allows them to go ahead and plan it out. And you know, I think, um, so a lot of people are thinking right now, I thought I had to deed houses I'm buying like everybody else in America, my personal name. Well, maybe not, maybe an LLC. Okay, so you're getting there. But you need to explore this um, land trust and learn how to use it. It isn't difficult. And I would recommend you go to WalterWalker.com and click on the link to join the Financial Friends Network and then uh, make sure that you meet up in December in Jackson to learn the details. But you guys also go into the details of personal property trust, right? Right. So 
let's just say that you want to do some lending. Yeah. Why, not, why, not, why not create a trust? And this would be for holding money. And so this, the Acorn Financial Trust will be named as a lender on the deed of trust. <clears throat> and you can change that as many times as you want to. Where does this come into play? Uh, if you were doing hard money lending to, to somebody who wanted to make an issue that you did predatory lending, mm -hmm. how hard would it be to find Pretty easy. all the houses? Yeah. Real easy. We had, we had some guys that came into town that this story did not end well for the, these guys, but they, they came in, they, <clears throat> they, they're from a West coast state. They bought the house and typically they bought them anywhere from 20 to 40. Okay. One entity, they then created a loan to another entity that they owned. Oh. So money, money didn't change hands. They just created a loan. And then they sold that loan for full face value. Wow. And, and it was typically double what they paid for. Wow. And I know they're doing this because I sold them five or six houses. <laughs> of course. And I also know that after they filed bankruptcy, it didn't work. Uh, they lost every one of them, 200 houses. And wow. I got to buy a bunch of them back, <laughs> including some of the ones I sold them. Of course. At a discount. Not at the same price. No, of course not. Amazing, isn't it? <clears throat> That's like uh, uh, printing money, literally. Well, they uh, so that, you know that 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 activity is illegal in, in a lot of states. But what happened is the people they took them out to, on the road shows and sold these notes. They were nine oh, yeah. percent notes, and it just didn't work out because they over over cranked the the financing. Right. So the houses couldn't afford it. And what they were riding on, they were hoping that the market would increase 10% and then they could cash them out and everything would be fine. Our recovery in Jackson took way longer than most markets. We're now on the way to recovery, but this is 10 years later. Right. Years later. Right. Yeah, they were operating as speculators, not as investors, in my opinion. So, so trust can extend beyond just assets and property. You could also use a trust to own a car. You can own a trust associated with a self-directed account. You could have a trust for lending, right? So it's a really creative way to operate um, like in stealth mode. So nobody really knows the details of what you're doing. Well, sure. And you can do all of those. Well, let me ask something. You got a power boat. Let's say you got one, Jim. Do you want your name on that title? No. No. Probably not. I'd like to have a power boat, though. And then I come to the reservoir and see. You don't. You don't want to own yeah. it. You just want to use it. Yeah, I do. I like to rent them. Yeah, uh, no, things go wrong. Jet skis, also, by the way. Well, Cars. people get hurt. And people get run over. Yeah. And people do stupid things when they get on the water. Yeah. And so, why would you want your car title? Why in the world would you want your name on your car title? Right. You don't. And so you'd use a personal property trust. And we're going to talk about that, how to do that. It's, it's so simple. It's scary. You go ahead and create the trust agreement. You stick it in your back pocket. You go down there and get your license for the boat or, or uh, the DMV. car. And you would think that they'd want to see a copy of the trust. They don't know who owns it. They don't know enough about how trusts work. They think because we named it the Roadside Community Financial Trust, a roadside trust they think that's who the person is well it's not a person you don't know who's behind that title is that valuable i think so yes well, also I think of it like an rv also well it doesn't make any difference if nothing bad happens right matter of fact i had a i had an acquaintance out uh out at the reservoir in our town who's uh, i bought the list of boats owners in the state i think it cost me 25 dollars, and i got every kind of every county all the boats i was looking for a pontoon boat and i wanted a newer one so i was looking at who owns all these things <laughs> and i'm going down and i'm looking by dresses i'm sorting and in my neighborhood somebody bought a boat and i looked at the title and i knew this guy 
and he had just bought this $40,000 boat. Guess who owned it? Who? His deceased dad. Oh, wow. Now think of, now that's a very smooth move on his part. Yep. Because he'd already taken his estate through probate, so there couldn't be any future claims against his estate. Huh. But see, the, the trust doesn't have to be nearly that deceptive. Just put the title in the trust, and you got it. You still, you don't know who owns it. And then, you know, you can also, if you, depending how creative you want to be, um, you can go a trust to a trust to a trust. And the further, like down in, the further levels you go down, the more stealth you become. And the more complicated it becomes too, if, if, if you were to pass and leave something to your children, part of your legacy has got to be that you got to be able to unwrap it pretty easy too. You, so you got to think through all those things. Yeah, and the older you get, or the more people you know that pass away, the more you're concerned about it. That happens. We had a, a, a family relative that two days ago dropped dead at a heart attack at 60. Wow. And there, all this planning that he probably was going to do, yep. never did do. Like, I wish we could ask everybody listening to raise their hand if they don't have a will. Yeah. Yep, that's a great question. It's a good place to start. Everybody needs one. Well, all right, so here's a big picture, trust. All right, so the living trust is been around, has been around for a long, long time. And basically what that does, my mother and dad have one. And so they are both co-trustees and the beneficiaries are the four kids. But in that type of trust, the trustees have the power of direction. The trustees don't even have to know about what the assets, but the assets have to be conveyed into the trust. So they had their, they had their name. And so the reason people to use those living trusts primarily is not an asset protection. It's a management of in, in case, in, in if one of them becomes incapacitated, which is exactly what happened. And so you got, you got a, trustees that you can change out the trustees to manage the assets and uh, for real estate people i would think that would be very important yeah once, once you got the titling separating the assets and let's say you end up with 100 houses you go and you pass away the title is not going to be the problem it's how you're going to manage that many assets right and so the beneficiary of that land trust could be a living trust and mm. i think that's a good it's a good thing to do. That's a big thought of the day. Here's the last point I want to make on asset protection. I've been thinking about this lately because I know a number of people that have been through divorce and had family problems. And so first, I want to encourage you guys to keep your families um, as your top priority. I think uh, it's important that you, you spend time with your spouse and your kids and you never get more time. So spend that up front and make, that's really a great investment if you can invest time into your own families. However, if something does go wrong, then these trusts, there's some, probably I can picture some creative ways to help you with that as well. But really, I think it's a great investment for everybody to be grateful for your spouse and your kids. And I encourage you to spend time with them because if that explodes, um, that's a great way to lose a lot of assets really quickly. At least divide them. Yes. They get divided. They get divided pretty quick. It gets ugly pretty fast. And we know, and we know a lot of people that, uh, you know, if they think living together is expensive, wait till living apart happens. Yeah. Yep. It's yeah. it's pretty. But th life happens. Life. Yes, life. You know, you and I are both blessed with amazing families. You've got an awesome wife, Laura, and great kids. Um, and lately, I've been thinking a lot about my scenario, too. I feel super fortunate with Cheryl and, and my kids, Melissa and Chris and the grandkids. Not everybody has that, and I don't take it for granted. I'm grateful for it. Well, so my number one tip would be trust to me. Uh, that's the foundation of building your real estate career. Get, get that piece correct first. And then the technique, the financing, all that other stuff will come into play later. All right. So go to WalterWolfer.com, sign up for the Financial Friends Network. It's an awesome network. It's um, actually a life-changing network for most people. And I encourage you to do that. 
check out Trust Firewalls in Jackson, Mississippi in December. What are the dates, Walter? Uh, fifth, sixth, and seventh. Right, and by, in right in there. We're going to have a, a property opportunity tour the day awesome. before. So we're going to go. It, it, it helps people to see, let's look at a house. Let's look at the title. Yeah. Go down, run to run. Let's run title on it. See who owns it. And then you find out how powerful that is. Uh, I, you know, things, things happen when you get older. I, you've been to Love Shack and uh -huh. I put it in a trust in 2003 when I bought it. You know, if you don't write everything down or things change, right? I, I could not remember who owned it. And I, yep. had, I had some documentation. I had, to hire an abstractor to tell me who owns it. <laughs> Is that ridiculous? That's real life, though. That happens. Well, I'm glad it wasn't in, in your personal name, that's for sure. I don't have anything. Uh, one, one last thing, Jim, before yeah. we go. Uh, I really enjoy putting on these seminars because I always I have to engage in order to present them. But there are always many other presenters in these events. So I invite ringers to come and you've done, been on several of them. But I'm doing something that I hadn't done in many years. I, well, I've never even done it before. And that is uh, an event on how to negotiate profitable seller financing when buying. And that's coming up in the spring of next year. And we'll, we'll have some live uh, negotiations. We'll get sellers to come in. Uh, it's a lot of fun when we divide the room into teams and then everybody's got to stand up and present an offer, a seller financing mm -hmm. offer. And I love it. That's one of my favorite topics actually because it's all about creative deal structuring and there's just so many different ways to divide up a house. I love it. Well good, you're my first ringer. You want to come? <laughs> I love coming to Jackson. I absolutely love it and absolutely like highest recommendation because it is a great group of people. The Financial Friends Network is a great group of truly life-changing people that you're going to, they're just great people <laughs> and they're super smart and they're doing real life deals. And Walter, you've, you've really expanded that network tremendously. So congratulations. Thank you, Jim. Walter, thank you. I mean, for years, I've been fortunate to have you as a friend, and uh, Cheryl and I are very grateful for your family, and um, so thank you very much for all of that, for many, Likewise. many years. Many Likewise. more to come, right? Many more to come. Thank you, Jim. All, right. all right. I look forward to seeing you again soon, and thanks for being my guest today on the Real Estate Success Podcast. You're truly a giver, and you've really made an impact on a lot of people, so thanks for that, Walter.